Tonight, bankruptcy, hackers, and other troubles at Mount Gox, a faster Netflix for some, and Edward Snowden's advice for you. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 40 for Monday, March 10th, 2014. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by 99designs, which connects businesses seeking quality, affordable designs with a community of more than 270,000 graphic designers. Visit 99designs.com slash TN2 and receive a free power pack upgrade valued at $99. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right to the tech feed. Yesterday, troubled Bitcoin exchange Mt. Gox filed for Chapter 15 bankruptcy proceedings in the U.S., which allows foreign debtors and parties to use the U.S. bankruptcy courts and systems to better solve the case and protect all involved creditors along with Mt. Gox and whatever assets it has remaining. Meanwhile, anonymous hackers have published financial data to Mt. Gox CEO Mark Carpoli's blog and allegedly originated from Mt. Gox's own servers that shows the exchange still may possess more than 750,000 bitcoins previously reported as stolen. The story just keeps getting more and more weird. Apple released its iOS 7.1 software update this morning, which fixes bugs, adds a few features, and improves animations and transitions. Among some of the new features, the iOS calendar now has a dedicated list and tray view button. The camera app will now indicate when auto flash will indeed trigger that flash. And Siri now supports a push to talk option for more flexible speech recognition. CarPlay support is noted in the release notes as well. iOS 7.1 first showed up in beta to developers back in November with the most recent update in early February. Previous rumors that the mobile operating system would be tied to the current iTunes Festival app did prove untrue. Well, Netflix's latest speed rankings show that the streaming service got a performance boost on Comcast in February, reversing a months-long trend of slowdowns after Netflix then announced in, on February 23rd that it had agreed to pay Comcast for a direct connection to its network. Netflix streamed at an average of 1.68 megabits per second on Comcast in the U.S. in February, which is up for, from 1.51 megabits per second in January but still down from two megabits per second back in September. However, because the deal came so late in February, average performance in March and then beyond may end up much higher. In other streaming news, the highly anticipated season one finale of HBO's True Detective was rendered unwatchable for some fans, including myself, connecting through the HBO Go app last night after demand took down some HBO Go live stream servers. There aren't any publicly available metrics on the ratio of users per HBO Go accounts, but the company acknowledged the issue in a tweet from its official HBO account. Cloud backup services will soon have a local competitor. Sony and Panasonic have announced a next generation optical disc format called the Archival Disc, which will launch in the summer of 2015. The Archival Disc will start with a capacity of 300 gigabytes and then increase to 500 gigabytes and then one terabyte sometime in the future. If you compare that to a current Blu-ray disc, that supports up to 128 gigabytes. So the archival disk format increases that by nearly a factor of three. It uses a double-sided disk technology with three layers per side and a data bit length of 79.5 nanometers and a track pitch of 0.225 micrometers. Sony and Panasonic both stress that the new format has been designed for, quote, the market for long-term digital data storage. Well, coming up, the solution that brought sunlight to a Norwegian town stuck in darkness. It only took 100 years. And up next, Denise Howell is with us to talk about the advice that Edward Snowden gave us all at his live video conference during South by Southwest this morning. But first, let's thank 99designs. They connect all types of people looking for great graphic design, and they're a sponsor of this episode of Tech News Tonight. Whether you need a new logo or an app or a business card, a T-shirt, any kind of graphic design at all, you'll find the right designer for your project at 99designs. You just tell them what you need. Then dozens of designers from the community start submitting designs created specifically for you. Then you give the designers your feedback, they refine their designs, and then you select and pay for the one you like the best. 
Start your next graphic design project for as low as $199. Just visit 99designs.com slash TN2 and get a $99 power pack of services completely free. That power pack will give you more designer time, more attention. 99designs will bold and highlight and feature your design in their marketplace and you'll get nearly twice as many designs to choose from. Visit 99designs.com slash TN2, and we thank them for their support of Tech News Tonight. All right, joining us now is our friend, Denise Howell, host of This Week in Law. Hello, Denise. Hi, Sarah. Great to be here. Good to have you as well. All right, well, we figured there would be nobody better to talk a little bit about the legality of encryption than, than our very own Denise Howell, as I mentioned during South by Southwest. In his first live video conference, Edward Snowden warned the public of some stuff. I would say the overarching theme was encrypt, then you can evade and obscure your activities. What did you think about the speech? Did you watch it? I didn't watch it. I watched it after the fact and have been following the coverage of it. Uh, and I think it's just great that um, he continues to bring attention to an issue that I think uh, everyone in our country and around the world is concerned about, doesn't quite know what to do uh, about the situation, and that the more people talk about it and, and hand ring about it, uh, the more that productive steps will be taken. So uh, great that he could appear at South by Southwest like this. And interestingly enough, uh, was using Google Hangout uh, to connect. Uh, the ACLU's Ben Wisner, who was moderating the conversation, made some points that there are good uh, encryption tools. PGP is one of them, Tor is another, but that they have such a barrier to entry that they end up not being of any use for people who are less technically inclined, but still deserve the same amount of privacy. What do you think is the next step for this sort of divide between people who understand these tools and people who don't? I think the market will take control of this and recognize that people want to have tools that will keep them as secure as possible. I don't know about you, Sarah. You know, we sort of live in a bubble and uh, folks that pay attention to these issues and even know that Snowden spoke at South by Southwest or even what South by Southwest is. But the people outside that bubble are coming to me all the time and asking, you know, what do you use? What do you suggest I should use? And is there anything at all we can do about this? So I think there's market demand out there and that we'll start to see uh, just a lot of opportunistic uh, and hopefully well-meaning folks taking advantage of that. Snowden did say, uh, he was in front of a, I guess, green screen of the U.S. Constitution and said, uh, and, and encryption can help bring about a more constitutional intelligence gathering model. Do you think that he's right? Do you think that's true? Well, I think it's a little bit more nuanced than that. You know, if there, if there's, we, we have this great system in the United States that I think is a model to countries uh, everywhere that where, you know, if we have probable cause and there. Uh, is reason to believe that wrongdoing has been done or might be done. We have processes to go through where that information can be obtained. And, uh, you know, we have due process in this country. That's part of the Constitution. Uh, but so encryption doesn't do away with that, but it certainly uh, helps the due process uh, steps be taken. So, uh, Certainly, you, you can't just uh, hide behind having encryption on your computer or your connection, uh, but, but having it there certainly presents a barrier that wouldn't be there otherwise. And uh, it can be dispensed with, but there have to be proper legal, legal steps taken to make it go away. There are a lot of uh, folks who, who, who understand how encryption works, but, but still say, if, say, the NSA wants to read my mail or listen to my conversations or intercept something that is encrypted, even if it's end-to-end -end encryption, they can do that. What is your thought on, uh, on, on where we stand with this? Is, is there really any uh, a actual uh, barriers against the NSA if they want to track you down? Not now, but there are constitutional challenges pending in courts around the United States that could impact that. And, and so folks need to get their donations into organizations like Public Knowledge and the EFF 
and uh, just, you know, pay, continue paying attention and uh, communicating with their elected representatives that if they don't think this is okay, if they think that uh, greater constitutional scrutiny has to be given to these actions, because where the change is going to come is from a court saying, yes, this was a step too far and uh, we have to rein in this kind of activity. Were you surprised to see Edward Snowden speaking at South by Southwest? I, I, I know when I, I was excited for the talk, but I thought, hmm, seems almost unusual to me that it would be that it would be at that conference that is so kind of social and I dare say lighthearted. Yeah, I've never been to South by Southwest. I, I do think that they do a lot of substance there. Never having been, there's probably a lot of non-substance there as well. But um, there are always fascinating panels on uh, areas that we like to follow on This Week in Law, on law and policy and um, how we impact change in those areas. So I wasn't terribly surprised. I, I was surprised by, by their ability to um, have him be on a panel with them. I'm sure logistically that was not easy and uh, simply getting in touch with him and arranging that, it was quite a coup for them. Well, Denise Howell, thank you so much for talking with us for a few minutes. Um, your first Tech News Tonight, certainly not your last. Uh, tell folks where they can find uh, your work online and, and of course This Week in Law, which airs here on the Twit Network. Right, of course you guys know uh, about This Week in Law, I hope. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, I'm D Howell over there. We have uh, a show page on Facebook and Google Plus for This Week in Law, so get in touch if you have suggestions for us. We'd love to hear about it. Excellent, thanks for joining us, Denise. All right, thank you, Sarah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Finally, let there be light. Uh, Ryuken, which is a small town in Norway, and I'm probably not saying that right, but it's located in a valley and it's so far north, it doesn't actually get any direct sunshine for five months during the winter. Now, thanks to a computer-controlled mirrors, a small patch of the city square, which is about 2,000 square feet, gets sunlight during the day from September through March. The town's founder thought up this idea 100 years ago. However, the technology wasn't available until now. This is the first full winter the heliostatic mirrors have been in use. Pretty surreal. Where are your sunscreen? And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write us at TN2 at twit.tv with feedback, suggestions, questions. Our next newscast is tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Until then, I'm Sarah Lane. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.